The Iliad, ancient Greek, Ilias Ilias, pronounced I, li, as in classical Attic, sometimes referred to as the Song of Ilion or Song of Ilium is an ancient Greek epic poem in dactylic hexameter, traditionally attributed to Homer. Set during the Trojan War, the ten-year siege of the city of Troy Ilium by a coalition of Greek states, it tells of the battles and events during the weeks of a quarrel between King Agamemnon and the warrior Achilles. Although the story covers only a few weeks in the final year of the war, the Iliad mentions or alludes to many of the Greek legends about the siege, the earlier events, such as the gathering of warriors for the siege, the cause of the war, and related concerns tend to appear near the beginning. Then the epic narrative takes up events prophesied for the future, such as Achilles' imminent death and the fall of Troy, although the narrative ends before these events take place. However, as these events are prefigured and alluded to more and more vividly, when it reaches an end the poem has told a more or less complete tale of the Trojan War. The Iliad is paired with something of a sequel, the Odyssey, also attributed to Homer. Along with the Odyssey, the Iliad is among the oldest extant works of Western literature, and its written version is usually dated to around the 8th century BC. In the modern Vulgate, the standard accepted version, the Iliad contains 15,693 lines. It is written in Homeric Greek, a literary amalgam of Ionic Greek and other dialects. According to Michael N. Nagler, the Iliad is a more complicated epic poem than the Odyssey. Topic: <laughs> Synopsis. Note, book numbers are in parentheses and come before the synopsis of the book. 1. After an invocation to the Muses, the story launches in Medias Res towards the end of the Trojan War between the Trojans and the besieging Greeks. Chryses, a Trojan priest of Apollo, offers the Greeks wealth for the return of his daughter Chryses, held captive of Agamemnon, the Greek leader. Although most of the Greek army is in favor of the offer, Agamemnon refuses. Chrysus prays for Apollo's help, and Apollo causes a plague to afflict the Greek army. After nine days of plague, Achilles, the leader of the Myrmidon contingent, calls an assembly to deal with the problem. Under pressure, Agamemnon agrees to return Chrysus to her father, but decides to take Achilles captive, Briseis, as compensation. Angered, Achilles declares that he and his men will no longer fight for Agamemnon and will go home. Odysseus takes a ship and returns Chrysus to her father, whereupon Apollo ends the plague. In the meantime, Agamemnon's messengers take Briseis away. Achilles becomes very upset, sits by the seashore, and prays to his mother, Thetis. Achilles asks his mother to ask Zeus to bring the Greeks to the breaking point by the Trojans, so Agamemnon will realize how much the Greeks need Achilles. Thetis does so, and Zeus agrees. 2. Zeus sends a dream to Agamemnon, urging him to attack Troy. Agamemnon heeds the dream but decides to first test the Greek army's morale, by telling them to go home. The plan backfires, and only the intervention of Odysseus, inspired by Athena, stops a rout. Odysseus confronts and beats Thersites, a common soldier who voices discontent about fighting Agamemnon's war. After a meal, the Greeks deploy in companies upon the Trojan plain. The poet takes the opportunity to describe the provenance of each Greek contingent. When news of the Greek deployment reaches King Priam, the Trojans to sortie upon the plain. In a list similar to that for the Greeks, the poet describes the Trojans and their allies. 3. The armies approach each other, but before they meet, Paris offers to end the war by fighting a duel with Menelaus, urged by his brother and head of the Trojan army, Hector. While Helen tells Priam about the Greek commanders from the walls of Troy, both sides swear a truce and promise to abide by the outcome of the duel. Paris is beaten, but Aphrodite rescues him and leads him to bed with Helen before Menelaus can kill him. 4. Pressured by Hera's hatred of Troy, Zeus arranges for the Trojan Pandaros to break the truce by wounding Menelaus with an arrow. Agamemnon rouses the Greeks, and battle is joined. Five, in the fighting, Diomedes kills many Trojans, including Pandaros, and defeats Aeneas, whom Aphrodite rescues, but Diomedes attacks and wounds the goddess. Apollo faces Diomedes and warns him against warring with gods. Many heroes and commanders join in, including Hector, and the gods supporting each side try to influence the battle. Emboldened by Athena, Diomedes wounds Ares and puts him out of action. 6. Hector rallies the Trojans and prevents a rout. The Greek Diomedes and the Trojan Glaucos find common ground and exchange unequal gifts. 
Hector enters the city, urges prayers and sacrifices, incites Paris to battle, bids his wife Andromache and son Astyanax farewell on the city walls, and rejoins the battle. 7 Hector duels with Ajax, but nightfall interrupts the fight, and both sides retire. The Greeks agree to burn their dead, and build a wall to protect their ships and camp. While the Trojans quarrel about returning Helen, Paris offers to return the treasure he took and give further wealth as compensation, but not Helen, and the offer is refused. A day's truce is agreed for burning the dead, during which the Greeks also build their wall and a trench. 8 The next morning, Zeus prohibits the gods from interfering, and fighting begins anew. The Trojans prevail and force the Greeks back to their wall, while Hera and Athena are forbidden to help. Night falls before the Trojans can assail the Greek wall. They camp in the field to attack at first light, and their fires light the plain like stars. 9 Meanwhile, the Greeks are desperate. Agamemnon admits his error, and sends an embassy composed of Odysseus, Ajax, Phoenix, and two heralds to offer Briseis and extensive gifts to Achilles, who has been camped next to his ships throughout, if only he will return to the fighting. Achilles and his companion Patroclus receive the embassy well, but Achilles angrily refuses Agamemnon's offer and declares that he would only return to battle if the Trojans reached his ships and threatened them with fire. The embassy returns empty-handed. 10. Later that night, Odysseus and Diomedes venture out to the Trojan lines, kill the Trojan Dolan, and wreak havoc in the camps of some Thracian allies of Troy's. 11. In the morning, the fighting is fierce, and Agamemnon, Diomedes, and Odysseus are all wounded. Achilles sends Patroclus from his camp to inquire about the Greek casualties, and while there Patroclus is moved to pity by a speech of Nestor's. 12. The Trojans attack the Greek wall on foot. Hector, ignoring an omen, leads the terrible fighting. The Greeks are overwhelmed and routed, the wall's gate is broken, and Hector charges in. 13. Many fall on both sides. The Trojan seer Polydamus urges Hector to fall back and warns him about Achilles, but is ignored. 14. Hera seduces Zeus and lures him to sleep, allowing Poseidon to help the Greeks, and the Trojans are driven back onto the plain. 15. Zeus awakes and is enraged by Poseidon's intervention. Against the mounting discontent of the Greek supporting gods, Zeus sends Apollo to aid the Trojans, who once again breach the wall, and the battle reaches the ships. 16. Patroclus cannot stand to watch any longer and begs Achilles to be allowed to defend the ships. Achilles relents and lends Patroclus his armor, but sends him off with a stern admonition not to pursue the Trojans, lest he take Achilles' glory. Patroclus leads the Myrmidons into battle and arrives as the Trojans set fire to the first ships. The Trojans are routed by the sudden onslaught, and Patroclus begins his assault by killing Zeus's son Sarpedon, a leading ally of the Trojans. Patroclus, ignoring Achilles' command, pursues and reaches the gates of Troy, where Apollo himself stops him. Patroclus is set upon by Apollo and Euphorbos, and is finally killed by Hector. 17 Hector takes Achilles' armor from the fallen Patroclus, but fighting develops around Patroclus' body. 18. Achilles is mad with grief when he hears of Patroclus' death and vows to take vengeance on Hector. His mother Thetis grieves, too, knowing that Achilles is fated to die young if he kills Hector. Achilles is urged to help retrieve Patroclus' body but has no armor. Bathed in a brilliant radiance by Athena, Achilles stands next to the Greek wall and roars in rage. The Trojans are dismayed by his appearance, and the Greeks manage to bear Patroclus' body away. Polydamus urges Hector again to withdraw into the city, again Hector refuses, and the Trojans camp on the plain at nightfall. Patroclus is mourned. Meanwhile, at Thetis' request, Hephaestus fashions a new set of armor for Achilles, including a magnificently wrought shield. 19. In the morning, Agamemnon gives Achilles all the promised gifts, including Briseis, but Achilles is indifferent to them. Achilles fasts while the Greeks take their meal, straps on his new armor, and heaves his great spear. His horse Xanthus prophecies to Achilles his death. Achilles drives his chariot into battle. 20. Zeus lifts the ban on the gods' interference, and the gods freely help both sides. Achilles, burning with rage and grief, slays many. 21. Driving the Trojans before him, Achilles cuts off half their number in the river Scamandros and proceeds to slaughter them, filling the river with the dead. The river, angry at the killing, confronts Achilles but is beaten back by Hephaestus' firestorm. The gods fight among themselves. The great gates of the city are open to receive the fleeing Trojans, and Apollo leads Achilles away from the city by pretending to be a Trojan. 
22 when Apollo reveals himself to Achilles, the Trojans have retreated into the city, all except for Hector, who, having twice ignored the counsels of Polydamus, feels the shame of the rout and resolves to face Achilles, despite the pleas of his parents, Priam and Hecuba. When Achilles approaches, Hector's will fails him, and he is chased around the city by Achilles. Finally, Athena tricks him into stopping, and he turns to face his opponent. After a brief duel, Achilles stabs Hector through the neck. Before dying, Hector reminds Achilles that he, too, is fated to die in the war. Achilles takes Hector's body and dishonors it by dragging it behind his chariot. 23 The ghost of Patroclus comes to Achilles in a dream, urging him to carry out his burial rites and to arrange for their bones to be entombed together. The Greeks hold a day of funeral games, and Achilles gives out the prizes. 24 Dismayed by Achilles' continued abuse of Hector's body, Zeus decides that it must be returned to Priam. Led by Hermes, Priam takes a wagon out of Troy, across the plains, and into the Greek camp unnoticed. He clasps Achilles by the knees and begs for his son's body. Achilles is moved to tears, and the two lament their losses in the war. After a meal, Priam carries Hector's body back into Troy. Hector is buried, and the city mourns. Topic. Major characters The many characters of the Iliad are catalogued, the latter half of Book II, the Catalogue of Ships, lists commanders and cohorts, battle scenes feature quickly slain minor characters. Topic. Achaeans The Achaeans Achaioi also called Hellenes Greeks, Danons, Danaui or Argives Arge Agamemnon, king of Mycenae, leader of the Greeks. Achilles, son of Peleus, foremost warrior, leader of the Myrmidons and king of Thea, son of a divine mother, Thetis. Odysseus, king of Ithaca, Greek commander. Ajax the Greater, son of Telamon and king of Salamis. Menelaus, king of Sparta, husband of Helen and brother of Agamemnon. Diomedes, son of Tydeus, king of Argos. Ajax the Lesser, son of Oileus, commander of the Locrians. Patroclus, Achilles' closest companion. Nestor, king of Pylos, and trusted advisor to Agamemnon. Topic. Achilles and Patroclus Much debate has surrounded the nature of the relationship of Achilles and Patroclus, as to whether it can be described as a homoerotic one or not. Classical and Hellenistic Athenian scholars perceived it as pederastic, while others perceived it as a platonic warrior bond. Topic. Trojans The Trojan men Hector, son of King Priam, and the foremost Trojan warrior. Aeneas, son of Anchises and Aphrodite. Diphobus, brother of Hector and Paris. Paris, son of King Priam, and Helen's lover abductor. Priam, the aged king of Troy. Polydamus, a prudent commander whose advice is ignored, he is Hector's foil. Agner, a Trojan warrior, son of Antenor, who attempts to fight Achilles Book 21. Sarpedon, son of Zeus, killed by Patroclus. Was friend of Glaucus and co-leader of the Lycians fought for the Trojans. Glaucus, son of Hippolochus, friend of Sarpedon and co-leader of the Lycians fought for the Trojans. Euphorbus, first Trojan warrior to wound Patroclus. Dolan, a spy upon the Greek camp Book X. Antenor, King Priam's advisor, who argues for returning Helen to end the war. Polydorus, son of Priam and Laetho. Pandarus, famous archer and son of Lycon. The Trojan women. Hecuba, Hecabe Hecabe Priam's wife, mother of Hector, Cassandra, Paris, and others. Helen, Helen daughter of Zeus, Menelaus's wife, espoused first to Paris, then to Diphobus, her abduction by Paris precipitated the war. Andromache, Hector's wife, mother of Astyanax. Cassandra, Priam's daughter. Briseis, a Trojan woman captured by Achilles from a previous siege, over whom Achilles's quarrel with Agamemnon began. Topic. Gods In the literary Trojan War of the Iliad, the Olympian gods, goddesses, and minor deities fight among themselves and participate in human warfare, often by interfering with humans to counter other gods. 
Unlike their portrayals in Greek religion, Homer's portrayal of gods suited his narrative purpose. The gods in traditional thought of 4th century Athenians were not spoken of in terms familiar to us from Homer. The classical era historian Herodotus says that Homer and Hesiod, his contemporary, were the first writers to name and describe the gods' appearance and character. In Greek gods' human lives, what we can learn from myths, Mary Lefkowitz discusses the relevance of divine action in the Iliad, attempting to answer the question of whether or not divine intervention is a discrete occurrence for its own sake, or if such godly behaviors are mere human character metaphors. The intellectual interest of classic-era authors, such as Thucydides and Plato, was limited to their utility as a way of talking about human life rather than a description or a truth. Because, if the gods remain religious figures, rather than human metaphors, their existence, without the foundation of either dogma or a Bible of faiths, then allowed Greek culture the intellectual breadth and freedom to conjure gods fitting any religious function they required as a people. The religion had no founder and was not the creation of an inspired teacher which were popular origins of existing religions in the world. The individuals were free to believe what they wanted, as the Greek religion was created out of a consensus of the people. These beliefs coincide to the thoughts about the gods in polytheistic Greek religion. In the article, Greek Religion, A.W.H. Adkins, agrees with this by saying, the early Greeks personalized every aspect of their world, natural and cultural, and their experiences in it. The earth, the sea, the mountains, the rivers, custom law themis, and one's share in society and its goods were all seen in personal as well as naturalistic terms. As a result of this thinking, each god or goddess in polytheistic Greek religion is attributed to an aspect of the human world. For example, Poseidon is the god of the sea, Aphrodite is the goddess of beauty, Ares is the god of war, and so on and so forth for many other gods. This is how Greek culture was defined as many Athenians felt the presence of their gods through divine intervention in significant events in their lives. Oftentimes they found these events to be mysterious and inexplicable. In The Origin of Consciousness in the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind, psychologist Julian Jaynes uses the Iliad as a major piece of evidence for his theory of bicameralism, which posits that until about the time described in the Iliad, humans had a much different mentality than present day humans. He says that humans during that time were lacking what we today call consciousness. He suggests that humans heard and obeyed commands from what they identified as gods, until the change in human mentality that incorporated the motivating force into the conscious self. He points out that almost every action in the Iliad is directed, caused, or influenced by a god, and that earlier translations show an astonishing lack of words suggesting thought, planning, or introspection. Those that do appear, he argues, are misinterpretations made by translators imposing a modern mentality on the characters. Topic. Divine intervention Some scholars believe that the gods may have intervened in the mortal world because of quarrels they may have had among each other. Homer interprets the world at this time by using the passion and emotion of the gods to be determining factors of what happens on the human level. An example of one of these relationships in the Iliad occurs between Athena, Hera, and Aphrodite. In the final book of the poem Homer writes, he offended Athena and Hera, both goddesses, Athena and Hera are envious of Aphrodite because of a beauty pageant on Mount Olympus in which Paris chose Aphrodite to be the most beautiful goddess over both Hera and Athena. Wolfgang Kullmann further goes on to say, Hera's and Athena's disappointment over the victory of Aphrodite in the judgment of Paris determines the whole conduct of both goddesses in the Iliad and is the cause of their hatred for Paris, the judge, and his town Troy. Hera and Athena then continue to support the Achaean forces throughout the poem because Paris is part of the Trojans, while Aphrodite aids Paris and the Trojans. The emotions between the goddesses often translate to actions they take in the mortal world. For example, in Book Three of the Iliad, Paris challenges any of the Achaeans to a single combat and Menelaus steps forward. Menelaus was dominating the battle and was on the verge of killing Paris. Now he'd have hauled him off and won undying glory but Aphrodite, Zeus's daughter was quick to the mark, snapped the rawhide strap, Aphrodite intervened out of her own self-interest to save Paris from the wrath of Menelaus because Paris had helped her to win the beauty pageant. The partisanship of Aphrodite towards Paris induces constant intervention by all of the gods, especially to give motivational speeches to their respective protégés, while often appearing in the shape of a human being they are familiar with. This connection of emotions to actions is just one example out of many that occur throughout the poem. 
Topic Themes Topic Fate Fate Kur Kur Fated Death propels most of the events of the Iliad. Once set, gods and men abide it, neither truly able nor willing to contest it. How fate is set is unknown, but it is told by the fates and by Zeus through sending omens to seers such as Calchas. Men and their gods continually speak of heroic acceptance and cowardly avoidance of one's slated fate. Fate does not determine every action, incident, and occurrence, but it does determine the outcome of life. Before killing him, Hector calls Patroclus a fool for cowardly avoidance of his fate. By attempting his defeat, Patroclus retorts, No, deadly destiny, with the son of Leto, has killed me. And of men it was Euphorbos, you are only my third slayer. And put away in your heart this other thing that I tell you. You yourself are not one who shall live long, but now already, death and powerful destiny are standing beside you. To go down under the hands of Iaco's great son, Achilles. Here, Patroclus alludes to fated death by Hector's hand, and Hector's fated death by Achilles's hand. Each accepts the outcome of his life, yet, no one knows if the gods can alter fate. The first instance of this doubt occurs in Book 16. Seeing Patroclus about to kill Sarpedon, his mortal son, Zeus says, Ah me, that it is destined that the dearest of men, Sarpedon, must go down under the hands of Menoetio's son Patroclus. About his dilemma, Hera asks Zeus, Majesty, son of Kronos, what sort of thing have you spoken? Do you wish to bring back a man who is mortal, one long since doomed by his destiny, from ill-sounding death and release him? Do it, then, but not all the rest of us gods shall approve you. In deciding between losing a son or abiding fate, Zeus, king of the gods, allows it. This motif recurs when he considers sparing Hector, whom he loves and respects. This time, it is Athene who challenges him. Father of the shining bolt, dark misted, what is this you said? Do you wish to bring back a man who is mortal, one long since doomed by his destiny, from ill-sounding death and release him? Do it, then, but not all the rest of us gods shall approve you. Again, Zeus appears capable of altering fate, but does not, deciding instead to abide set outcomes, yet, contrarywise, fate spares Aeneas, after Apollo convinces the overmatched Trojan to fight Achilles. Poseidon cautiously speaks, But come, let us ourselves get him away from death, for fear the son of Kronos may be angered if now Achilles kills this man. It is destined that he shall be the survivor, that the generation of Dardanus shall not die, Divinely aided, Aeneas escapes the wrath of Achilles and survives the Trojan War. Whether or not the gods can alter fate, they do abide it, despite its countering their human allegiances, thus, the mysterious origin of fate is a power beyond the gods. Fate implies the primeval, tripartite division of the world that Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades effected in deposing their father, Cronus, for its dominion. Zeus took the air and the sky, Poseidon the waters, and Hades the underworld, the land of the dead, yet they share dominion of the earth. Despite the earthly powers of the Olympic gods, only the three fates set the destiny of man. Topic. Cleos Cleos glory, fame, is the concept of glory earned in heroic battle. For most of the Greek invaders of Troy, notably Odysseus, Cleos is earned in a victorious nostos homecoming. Yet, Achilles must choose only one of the two rewards, either Nostos or Cleos. In Book X, X he poignantly tells Agamemnon's envoys, Odysseus, Phoenix, Ajax, begging his reinstatement to battle about having to choose between two fates, Dictadius Caras 9.411, the passage reads, In foregoing his Nostos, he will earn the greater reward of Cleos Aphthician, Cleos Aphthician, fame imperishable. In the poem, Aphthician, Aphthician. Imperishable occurs five other times, each occurrence denotes an object, Agamemnon's scepter, the wheel of Hebe's chariot, the house of Poseidon, the throne of Zeus, the house of Hephaestus. Translator Lattimore renders Cleos Aphthician as forever immortal and as forever imperishable, connoting Achilles' as mortality by underscoring his greater reward in returning to battle Troy. Cleos is often given visible representation by the prizes won in battle. When Agamemnon takes Briseis from Achilles, he takes away a portion of the Cleos he had earned. 
Achilles' shield, crafted by Hephaestus and given to him by his mother Thetis, bears an image of stars in the center. The stars conjure profound images of the place of a single man, no matter how heroic, in the perspective of the entire cosmos. Nostos Nostos homecoming, occurs seven times in the poem. Thematically, the concept of homecoming is much explored in ancient Greek literature, especially in the post-war homeward fortunes experienced by the Atreidae Agamemnon and Menelaus, and Odysseus see the Odyssey. Thus, Nostos is impossible without sacking Troy—King Agamemnon's motive for winning, at any cost. <laughs> Pride Pride drives the plot of the Iliad. The Greeks gather on the plain of Troy to wrest Helen from the Trojans. Though the majority of the Trojans would gladly return Helen to the Greeks, they defer to the pride of their prince, Alexandros, also known as Paris. Within this frame, Homer's work begins. At the start of the Iliad, Agamemnon's pride sets forth a chain of events that leads him to take from Achilles, Briseis, the girl that he had originally given Achilles in return for his martial prowess. Due to this slight, Achilles refuses to fight and asks his mother, Thetis, to make sure that Zeus causes the Greeks to suffer on the battlefield until Agamemnon comes to realize the harm he has done to Achilles. Achilles' pride allows him to beg Thetis for the deaths of his Greek friends and countrymen. When in Book 9 his friends urge him to return, offering him loot and his girl, Briseis, he refuses, stuck in his vengeful pride. Achilles remains stuck until the very end, when his anger at himself for Patroclus' death overcomes his pride at Agamemnon's slight and he returns to kill Hector. He overcomes his pride again when he keeps his anger in check and returns Hector to Priam at Epic's close. From Epic start to Epic finish, pride drives the plot. <laughs> time Akin to Cleos's time. Respect, honor. The concept denoting the respectability an honorable man accrues with accomplishment cultural, political, martial, per his station in life. In Book 1, the Greek troubles begin with King Agamemnon's dishonorable, unkingly behavior. First, by threatening the priest Chrysus 1.11, then, by aggravating them in disrespecting Achilles, by confiscating Briseis from him 1.171. The warrior's consequent rancor against the dishonorable king ruins the Greek military cause. Topic: Hybris. Hybris, Hybris plays a part similar to time. The epic takes as its thesis the anger of Achilles and the destruction it brings. Anger disturbs the distance between human beings and the gods. Uncontrolled anger destroys orderly social relationships and upsets the balance of correct actions necessary to keep the gods away from human beings. Footnote Thompson. Despite the epic's focus on Achilles' rage, Hybris plays a prominent role also, serving as both kindling and fuel for many destructive events. Agamemnon refuses to ransom Chryseis up out of Hybris and harms Achilles' pride when he demands Briseis. Hybris forces Paris to fight against Menelaus. Agamemnon spurs the Greeks to fight, by calling into question Odysseus, Diomedes, and Nestor's pride, asking why they were cowering and waiting for help when they should be the ones leading the charge. While the events of the Iliad focus on the Achilles' rage and the destruction it brings on, Hybris fuels and stokes them both. Menace The poem's initial word, menon menon, accusative of menace, menace, wrath, rage, fury, establishes the Iliad's principal theme, the wrath of Achilles. His personal rage and wounded soldiers' vanity propel the story, the Greeks faltering in battle, the slayings of Patroclus and Hector, and the fall of Troy. In Book 1, the wrath of Achilles first emerges in the Achilles-convoked meeting, between the Greek kings and the seer Calchas. King Agamemnon dishonors Chrysas, the Trojan priest of Apollo, by refusing with a threat the restitution of his daughter, Chrysas, despite the proffered ransom of gifts beyond count. The insulted priest prays his god's help, and a nine-day reign of divine plague arrows falls upon the Greeks. Moreover, in that meeting, Achilles accuses Agamemnon of being greediest for gain of all men. To that, Agamemnon replies, But here is my threat to you. Even as Phoebus Apollo is taking away my Chrysas, I shall convey her back in my own ship, with my own 
followers, but I shall take the fair-cheeked Briseis. Your prize, I myself going to your shelter, that you may learn well how much greater I am than you, and another man may shrink back from likening himself to me and contending against me. After that, only Athena stays Achilles's wrath. He vows to never again obey orders from Agamemnon. Furious, Achilles cries to his mother, Thetis, who persuades Zeus's divine intervention, favoring the Trojans, until Achilles's rights are restored. Meanwhile, Hector leads the Trojans to almost pushing the Greeks back to the sea book 12. Later, Agamemnon contemplates defeat and retreat to Greece book 14. Again, the wrath of Achilles turns the war's tide in seeking vengeance when Hector kills Patroclus. Aggrieved, Achilles tears his hair and dirties his face. Thetis comforts her mourning son, who tells her, So it was here that the lord of men Agamemnon angered me. Still, we will let all this be a thing of the past, and for all our sorrow beat down by force the anger deeply within us. Now I shall go, to overtake that killer of a dear life, Hector, then I will accept my own death, at whatever time Zeus wishes to bring it about, and the other immortals. Accepting the prospect of death as fair price for avenging Patroclus, he returns to battle, dooming Hector and Troy, thrice chasing him round the Trojan walls, before slaying him, then dragging the corpse behind his chariot, back to camp. Topic. Date and textual history The poem dates to the archaic period of classical antiquity. Scholarly consensus mostly places it in the 8th century BC, although some favor a 7th century date. Herodotus, having consulted the oracle at Dodona, placed Homer and Hesiod at approximately 400 years before his own time, which would place them at c. 850 BC. The historical backdrop of the poem is the time of the Late Bronze Age collapse, in the early 12th century BC. Homer is thus separated from his subject matter by about 400 years, the period known as the Greek Dark Ages. Intense scholarly debate has surrounded the question of which portions of the poem preserve genuine traditions from the Mycenaean period. The catalogue of ships in particular has the striking feature that its geography does not portray Greece in the Iron Age, the time of Homer, but as it was before the Dorian invasion. The title Ilias, Ilias, genitive Iliados, Iliados, is elliptic for he poesis Ilias, he poesis Ilias, meaning the Trojan poem. Ilias, of Troy, is the specifically feminine adjective form from Ilion, Troy. The masculine adjective form would be Iliakos or Ilios. It is used by Herodotus, Venetus A, copied in the 10th century AD, is the oldest fully extant manuscript of the Iliad. The first edition of the Iliad, Adidio Princeps, edited by Demetrius Chalcondyles and published by Bernardus Nerlius, and Demetrius de Milas in Florence in 1488-89. The Iliad as oral tradition In antiquity, the Greeks applied the Iliad and the Odyssey as the basis of pedagogy. Literature was central to the educational cultural function of the itinerant rhapsode, who composed consistent epic poems from memory and improvisation, and disseminated them, via song and chant, in his travels and at the Panathenaic festival of athletics, music, poetics, and sacrifice, celebrating Athena's birthday. Originally, classical scholars treated the Iliad and the Odyssey as written poetry, and Homer as a writer. Yet, by the 1920s, Milman Perry had launched a movement claiming otherwise. His investigation of the oral Homeric style, stock epithets, and reiteration, words, phrases, stanzas, established that these formulae were artifacts of oral tradition easily applied to an hexametric line. A two-word stock epithet e.g. resourceful Odysseus. Reiteration may complement a character name by filling a half-line, thus, freeing the poet to compose a half-line of original formulaic text to complete his meaning. In Yugoslavia, Perry and his assistant, Albert Lord (1912–1991), studied the oral formulaic composition of Serbian oral poetry, yielding the Perry Lord thesis that established oral tradition studies, later developed by Eric Havelock, Marshall McLuhan, Walter Ong, and Gregory Nagy. In The Singer of Tales 1960, Lord presents likenesses between the tragedies of the Greek Patroclus, in the Iliad, and of the Sumerian Enkidu, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, and claims to refute, with, 
careful analysis of the repetition of thematic patterns that the Patroclus storyline upsets Homer's established compositional formulae of wrath, bride stealing, and rescue. Thus, stock phrase reiteration does not restrict his originality in fitting story to rhyme. Likewise, in the arming motif, Professor James Armstrong reports that the poem's formulae yield richer meaning because the arming motif diction describing Achilles, Agamemnon, Paris, and Patroclus serves to heighten the importance of an impressive moment. Thus, reiteration creates an atmosphere of smoothness, wherein, Homer distinguishes Patroclus from Achilles, and foreshadows the former's death with positive and negative turns of phrase. In the Iliad, occasional syntactic inconsistency may be an oral tradition effect for example, Aphrodite is laughter loving, despite being painfully wounded by Diomedes' Book V, 375, and the divine representations may mix Mycenaean and Greek Dark Age c. 1150-800 BC mythologies, paralleling the hereditary Basileus nobles lower social rank rulers with minor deities, such as Scamander, et al. Topic. Warfare in the Iliad Topic. Depiction of infantry combat Despite Mycenae and Troy being maritime powers, the Iliad features no sea battles. So, the Trojan shipwright of the ship that transported Helen to Troy, Phariclus, fights afoot, as an infantryman. The battle dress and armor of hero and soldier are well described. They enter battle in chariots, launching javelins into the enemy formations, then dismount for hand to hand combat with yet more javelin throwing, rock throwing, and if necessary hand to hand sword and a shoulder borne hoplon shield fighting. Ajax the Greater, son of Telamon, sports a large, rectangular shield, Seikos Seikos with which he protects himself and Teucer, his brother. Ninth came Teucer, stretching his curved bow. He stood beneath the shield of Ajax, son of Telamon. As Ajax cautiously pulled his shield aside, Teucer would peer out quickly, shoot off an arrow, hit someone in the crowd, dropping that soldier right where he stood, ending his life. Then he ducked back, crouching down by Ajax, like a child beside its mother. Ajax would then conceal him with his shining shield. Iliad 8.267-72, Ian Johnston, translator Ajax's cumbersome shield is more suitable for defense than for offense, while his cousin, Achilles, sports a large, rounded, octagonal shield that he successfully deploys along with his spear against the Trojans. Just as a man constructs a wall for some high house, using well-fitted stones to keep out forceful winds. That's how close their helmets and bossed shields lined up. Shield pressing against shield, helmet against helmet, man against man. On the bright ridges of the helmets, horsehair plumes touched when warriors moved their heads. That's how close they were to one another. Iliad 16.213-17, Ian Johnston, translator In describing infantry combat, Homer names the phalanx formation, but most scholars do not believe the historical Trojan War was so fought. In the Bronze Age, the chariot was the main battle transport weapon e.g. the Battle of Kadesh. The available evidence, from the Dendra armor and the Pylos Palace paintings, indicate the Mycenaeans used two-man chariots, with a long spear-armed principal rider, unlike the three-man Hittite chariots with short spear-armed riders, and unlike the arrow-armed Egyptian and Assyrian two-man chariots. Nestor spearheads his troops with chariots, he advises them, In your eagerness to engage the Trojans, don't any of you charge ahead of others, trusting in your strength and horsemanship. And don't lag behind. That will hurt our charge. Any man whose chariot confronts an enemy's should thrust with his spear at him from there. That's the most effective tactic, the way men wiped out city strongholds long ago, their chests full of that style and spirit. Iliad 4.30109, Ian Johnston, translator Although Homer's depictions are graphic, it can be seen in the very end that victory in war is a far more somber occasion, where all that is lost becomes apparent. On the other hand, the funeral games are lively, for the dead man's life is celebrated. This overall depiction of war runs contrary to many other ancient Greek depictions, where war is an aspiration for greater glory. Topic. Influence on classical Greek warfare 
While the Homeric poems the Iliad in particular were not necessarily revered scripture of the ancient Greeks, they were most certainly seen as guides that were important to the intellectual understanding of any educated Greek citizen. This is evidenced by the fact that in the late 5th century BC, it was the sign of a man of standing to be able to recite the Iliad and Odyssey by heart. Moreover, it can be argued that the warfare shown in the Iliad, and the way in which it was depicted, had a profound and very traceable effect on Greek warfare in general. In particular, the effect of epic literature can be broken down into three categories, tactics, ideology, and the mindset of commanders. In order to discern these effects, it is necessary to take a look at a few examples from each of these categories. Much of the detailed fighting in the Iliad is done by the heroes in an orderly, one-on-one -on -one fashion. Much like the Odyssey, there is even a set ritual which must be observed in each of these conflicts. For example, a major hero may encounter a lesser hero from the opposing side, in which case the minor hero is introduced, threats may be exchanged, and then the minor hero is slain. The victor often strips the body of its armor and military accoutrements. Here is an example of this ritual and this type of one-on-one -on -one combat in the Iliad. Their Telamonian Ajax struck down the son of Anthemion, Simaezios in his stripling's beauty, whom once his mother descending from Ida bore beside the banks of Simois when she had followed her father and mother to tend the sheep flocks. Therefore they called him Simaezios, but he could not render again the care of his dear parents, he was short-lived, beaten down beneath the spear of high-hearted Ajax, who struck him as he first came forward beside the nipple, of the right breast, and the bronze spearhead drove clean through the shoulder. The biggest issue in reconciling the connection between the epic fighting of the Iliad and later Greek warfare is the phalanx, or hoplite, warfare seen in Greek history well after Homer's Iliad. While there are discussions of soldiers arrayed in semblances of the phalanx throughout the Iliad, the focus of the poem on the heroic fighting, as mentioned above, would seem to contradict the tactics of the phalanx. However, the phalanx did have its heroic aspects. The masculine one-on-one -on -one fighting of epic is manifested in phalanx fighting on the emphasis of holding one's position in formation. This replaces the singular heroic competition found in the Iliad. One example of this is the Spartan tale of 300 picked men fighting against 300 picked argives. In this battle of champions, only two men are left standing for the argives and one for the Spartans. Otheriades, the remaining Spartan, goes back to stand in his formation with mortal wounds while the remaining two Argives go back to Argos to report their victory. Thus, the Spartans claimed this as a victory, as their last man displayed the ultimate feat of bravery by maintaining his position in the phalanx. In terms of the ideology of commanders in later Greek history, the Iliad has an interesting effect. The Iliad expresses a definite disdain for tactical trickery, when Hector says, before he challenges the great Ajax, I know how to storm my way into the struggle of flying horses, I know how to tread the measures on the grim floor of the war god. Yet great as you are I would not strike you by stealth, watching for my chance, but openly, so, if perhaps I might hit you. However, despite examples of disdain for this tactical trickery, there is reason to believe that the Iliad, as well as later Greek warfare, endorsed tactical genius on the part of their commanders. For example, there are multiple passages in the Iliad with commanders such as Agamemnon or Nestor discussing the arraying of troops so as to gain an advantage. Indeed, the Trojan War is won by a notorious example of Greek guile in the Trojan horse. This is even later referred to by Homer in the Odyssey. The connection, in this case, between guileful tactics of the Greeks in the Iliad and those of the later Greeks is not a difficult one to find. Spartan commanders, often seen as the pinnacle of Greek military prowess, were known for their tactical trickery, and, for them, this was a feat to be desired in a commander. Indeed, this type of leadership was the standard advice of Greek tactical writers. Ultimately, while Homeric or epic fighting is certainly not completely replicated in later Greek warfare, many of its ideals, tactics, and instruction are. Hans van Wies argues that the period that the descriptions of warfare relate can be pinned down fairly specifically to the first half of the 7th century BC. Topic. Influence on the arts and literature The Iliad was a standard work of great importance already in classical Greece and remained so throughout the Hellenistic and Byzantine periods. Subjects from the Trojan War were a favorite among ancient Greek dramatists. 
Aeschylus trilogy, the Orestia, comprising Agamemnon, the Libation Bearers and the Eumenides, follows the story of Agamemnon after his return from the war. Homer also came to be of great influence in European culture with the resurgence of interest in Greek antiquity during the Renaissance, and it remains the first and most influential work of the Western canon. In its full form the text made its return to Italy and Western Europe beginning in the 15th century, primarily through translations into Latin and the vernacular languages. Prior to this reintroduction, however, a shortened Latin version of the poem, known as the Ilias Latina, was very widely studied and read as a basic school text. The West tended to view Homer as unreliable as they believed they possessed much more down-to-earth and realistic eyewitness accounts of the Trojan War written by Dares and Dictes Cretensis, who were supposedly present at the events. These late antique forged accounts formed the basis of several eminently popular medieval chivalric romances, most notably those of Benoit de saint maur and Guido della Colonne. These in turn spawned many others in various European languages, such as the first printed English book, the 1473 Recaille of the Histories of Troy. Other accounts read in the Middle Ages were antique Latin retellings such as the Exidium Troia and works in the vernaculars such as the Icelandic Troy Saga. Even without Homer, the Trojan War story had remained central to Western European medieval literary culture and its sense of identity. Most nations and several royal houses traced their origins to heroes at the Trojan War. Britain was supposedly settled by the Trojan Brutus, for instance, William Shakespeare used the plot of the Iliad as source material for his play Troilus and Cressida, but focused on a medieval legend, the love story of Troilus, son of King Priam of Troy, and Cressida, daughter of the Trojan soothsayer Calchas. The play, often considered to be a comedy, reverses traditional views on events of the Trojan War and depicts Achilles as a coward, Ajax as a dull, unthinking mercenary, etc. William Thede the Elder made an impressive bronze statue of Thetis as she brought Achilles his new armor forged by Hephaestus. It has been on display in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City since 2013. Robert Browning's poem Development discusses his childhood introduction to the matter of the Iliad and his delight in the epic, as well as contemporary debates about its authorship. 20th century Simone Weil wrote the essay, The Iliad or the Poem of Force, in 1939, shortly after the commencement of World War II. The essay describes how the Iliad demonstrates the way force, exercised to the extreme in war, reduces both victim and aggressor to the level of the slave and the unthinking automaton. The 1954 Broadway musical The Golden Apple, by librettist John Travel Latouche and composer Jerome Maras, was freely adapted from the Iliad and the Odyssey, resetting the action to America's Washington state in the years after the Spanish-American War, with events inspired by the Iliad in Act I and events inspired by the Odyssey in Act II. Christopher Logue's poem War Music, an account, not a translation, of the Iliad, was begun in 1959 as a commission for radio. He continued working on it until his death in 2011. Described by Tom Holland as, one of the most remarkable works of post-war literature, it has been an influence on Kate Tempest and Alice Oswald, who says that it, unleashes a forgotten kind of theatrical energy into the world. Krista Wolf's novel Cassandra is a critical engagement with the Iliad. Wolf's narrator is Cassandra, whose thoughts we hear at the moment just before her murder by Clytemnestra in Sparta. Wolf's narrator presents a feminist's view of the war, and of war in general. Cassandra's story is accompanied by four essays which Wolf delivered as the Frankfurter poetic Vorlesungen. The essays present Wolf's concerns as a writer and rewriter of this canonical story and show the genesis of the novel through Wolf's own readings and in a trip she took to Greece. David Melnick's Men in Ida CF, Men in Aid 1983, is a postmodern homophonic translation of Book One into a farcical bathhouse scenario, preserving the sounds but not the meaning of the original. Marion Zimmer Bradley's 1987 novel The Firebrand retells the story from the point of view of Cassandra, a princess of Troy and a prophetess who is cursed by Apollo. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Contemporary popular culture. Dan Simmons' epic science fiction adaptation Tribute Ilium was released in 2003, receiving a Locus Award for Best Science Fiction Novel of 2003. 
Troy 2004, a loose film adaptation of the Iliad, received mixed reviews but was a commercial success, particularly in international sales. It grossed $133 million in the United States and $497 million worldwide, making it the 188th top-grossing movie of all time. Eric Schnauer's Image Comics series Age of Bronze, which began in 1998, retells the legend of the Trojan War. Alice Oswald's sixth collection, Memorial 2011, is based on but departs from the narrative form of the Iliad to focus on, and so commemorate, the individually named characters whose deaths are mentioned in that poem. Later in October 2011, Memorial was shortlisted for the T.S. Eliot Prize, but in December 2011, Oswald withdrew the book from the shortlist, citing concerns about the ethics of the prize's sponsors. The Rage of Achilles, by American author and Yale Writers' Conference founder Terence Hawkins, recounts the Iliad as a novel in modern, sometimes graphic language. Informed by Julian Jaynes' theory of the bicameral mind and the historicity of the Trojan War, it depicts its characters as real men to whom the gods appear only as hallucinations or command voices during the sudden and painful transition to truly modern consciousness. The Righteous Dark, by American author Jake Enholm, features a main character named Adi based on Odysseus who is an artificial intelligence fighting other artificially intelligent beings in a war between two star systems in the future. The war lasts for ten years, and ends with Adi defeating the Trojan-like enemy by embedding his own mind inside a disguised upgrade to the enemy's operating system. <laughs> English translations. George Chapman published his translation of the Iliad, in installments, beginning in 1598, published in Fourteeners, a long-line ballad meter that has room for all of Homer's figures of speech and plenty of new ones, as well as explanations in parentheses. At its best, as in Achilles' rejection of the embassy in Iliad 9, it has great rhetorical power. It quickly established itself as a classic in English poetry. In the preface to his own translation, Pope praises the daring fiery spirit of Chapman's rendering, which is something like what one might imagine Homer, himself, would have writ before he arrived at years of discretion. John Keats praised Chapman in the sonnet on first looking into Chapman's Homer 1816. John O'Gilby's mid 17th century translation is among the early annotated editions. Alexander Pope's 1715 translation, in heroic couplet, is, the classic translation that was built on all the preceding versions, and, like Chapman's, it is a major poetic work in its own right. William Cowper's Miltonic, blank verse 1791 edition is highly regarded for its greater fidelity to the Greek than either the Chapman or the Pope versions. I have omitted nothing, I have invented nothing. Cowper says in prefacing his translation. In the Lectures on Translating Homer 1861, Matthew Arnold addresses the matters of translation and interpretation in rendering the Iliad to English, commenting upon the versions contemporarily available in 1861. He identifies the four essential poetic qualities of Homer to which the translator must do justice. I that he is eminently rapid, e that he is eminently plain and direct, both in the evolution of his thought and in the expression of it, that is, both in his syntax and in his words, e that he is eminently plain and direct in the substance of his thought, that is, in his matter and ideas, and, finally, iv that he is eminently noble. After a discussion of the meters employed by previous translators, Arnold argues for a poetical dialect hexameter translation of the Iliad, like the original. Laborious as this meter was, there were at least half a dozen attempts to translate the entire Iliad or Odyssey in hexameters, the last in 1945. Perhaps the most fluent of them was by J. Henry Dart 1862, in response to Arnold. In 1870, the American poet William Cullen Bryant published a blank verse version, that Van Wyck Brooks describes as, "...simple, faithful." An 1898 translation by Samuel Butler was published by Longmans. Butler had read classics at Cambridge University, graduating during 1859. Since 1950, there have been several English translations. Richmond Lattimore's version 1951 is a free six-beat, line-for-line rendering that explicitly eschews poetical dialect for the plain English of today. It is literal, unlike older verse renderings. 
Robert Fitzgerald's version Oxford World's Classics, 1974, strives to situate the Iliad in the musical forms of English poetry. His forceful version is freer, with shorter lines that increase the sense of swiftness and energy. Robert Fagel's Penguin Classics, 1990, and Stanley Lombardo, 1997, are bolder than Lattimore in adding dramatic significance to Homer's conventional and formulaic language. Rodney Merrill's translation, University of Michigan Press, 2007, not only renders the work in English verse like the dactylic hexameter of the original, but also conveys the oral formulaic nature of the epic song, to which that musical meter gives full value. Barry B. Powell's translation Oxford University Press, 2014, renders the Homeric Greek with a simplicity and dignity reminiscent of the original. Caroline Alexander published the first full-length English translation by a woman in 2016. Topic. Manuscripts There are more than 2,000 manuscripts of Homer. Some of the most notable manuscripts include Rom. Bibl. Nat. Gr. 6 plus Matriti. Bibl. Nat. 4626 from 870 to 890 AD. Venetus A equals Venetus Mark. 822 from the 10th century. Venetus B equals Venetus Mark. 821 from the 11th century. Ambrosian Iliad. Papyrus Oxyrhynchus 20. Papyrus Oxyrhynchus 21 Codex Nitriensis Palimpsest Topic See also Hellenismos portal Parallels between Virgil's Aeneid and Homer's Iliad and Odyssey Mask of Agamemnon Topic References Topic Bibliography Topic Further reading De Young, Irene Iliad. Book twenty two, Cambridge University Press, twenty twelve. ISBN nine trillion seven hundred eighty billion five hundred twenty one million seven hundred nine thousand seven hundred seventy four Edwards, Mark W., Janko, Richard, Kirk, G. S., The Iliad, A Commentary, Vol. 4, Books 13-16, Cambridge University Press, 1992. ISBN 0-521-28171-7 Edwards, Mark W., Kirk, G. S., The Iliad, A Commentary, Vol. 5, Books 17-20, Cambridge University Press, 1991. ISBN 0 to 521 x Graziosi, Barbara, Howbold, Johannes, Iliad, Book V, Cambridge University Press, 2010. ISBN 9780521878845 Hainsworth, Brian, Kirk, G. S., The Iliad, A Commentary, Volume 3. Books 9 to 12, Cambridge University Press, 1993. ISBN 0-521-23711-4. Kirk, G. S. The Iliad: A Commentary, Volume 1. Books 1 to 4, Cambridge University Press, 1985. ISBN 0-521-23709-2. Kirk, G. S., The Iliad, A Commentary, Vol. 2, Books 5-8, Cambridge University Press, 1990. ISBN 0-521-23710-6 Murray, A. T., Wyatt, William F., Homer, The Iliad, Books I-12, Loeb Classical Library, Harvard University Press, 1999, ISBN 978-0-674-99579-6 Richardson, Nicholas, Kirk, G. S., The Iliad, A Commentary, Vol. 6, Books 21-24, Cambridge University Press, 1993. ISBN 0-521-30960-3 West, Martin L., Studies in the Text and Transmission of the Iliad, Munchen, K. G. Soar, 2001. ISBN 3-598-73005-5 Topic. External links 
D. B. Monroe, Homer, Iliad, Books I-12, with an introduction, a brief Homeric grammar, and notes 3rd ed., 1890. D. B. Monroe, Homer, Iliad, Books XIII-24, with notes 4th ed., 1903. D. B. Monroe, A Grammar of the Homeric Dialect 2nd ed., 1891. Iliad, from the Perseus Project pp, with the Murray and Butler translations and hyperlinks to mythological and grammatical commentary Gods, Achaeans and Trojans. An interactive visualization of the Iliad's characters flow and relations. The Iliad, a study guide Comments on background, plot, themes, authorship, and translation issues by 2008 translator Herbert Jordan. Flaxman illustrations of the Iliad the Iliad Study Guide, Themes, Quotes, Teacher Resources The Iliad of Homer, Books I-24, translated into English blank verse by William Cowper, edition C.1860, online at Project Gutenberg. The Iliad of Homer, done into English prose by Andrew Lang, Walter Leaf and Ernest Myers. Revised edition, 1892, 25 megabytes pdf at archive.org the opening to the Iliad proem, read in ancient Greek with a simultaneous translation. The Iliad map, map of locations in the Iliad. Published English translations of Homer, with samples and some reviews by translator and scholar Ian Johnston. Digital facsimile of the first printed publication Princeps of the Iliad in Homeric Greek by Dimitrios Chakakondiles, Bayerische Staatsbibliothek. The Iliad Public Domain Audiobook at LibriVox.